on Saturday, June 3rd, 2017, something monumental happened for the first time in history. Alex Honnold summited Yosemite's El Capitan. But you may say, what's so great about that? Many people have summited that mountain before, so who cares? Alex Honnold was the first ever to climb the face of a mountain without the use of a rope or any safety gear. Something in the climbing world known as free soloing. As some say Honnold's triumph of El Capitan is the moon landing of free soloing. El Capitan is considered by many to be the epicenter of the rock climbing world. It is a vertical expanse reaching nearly half a mile, almost 3,000 feet in elevation. It is higher than the world's tallest building, the Burj Khalifa in Dubai. The face of the mountain that Honnold ascended and summited is a zigzaggy odyssey that traces several spidery networks of cracks and fissures, some gaping, others barely a knuckle wide. Along the way, Honnold squeezed his body into narrow chimneys, tiptoed across ledges the width of a matchbox, and in some places, dangled in the open air by just his fingertips. Alex Honnold summited the peak in three hours and 56 minutes, and at 9.28 a.m. under a blue sky and a few wisps of clouds, he pulled his body over the rocky lip of the summit and stood on a sandy ledge overlooking the valley the size of a child's bedroom. El Capitan had been summited, free soloed, and unaided by Alex Honnold. This evening, in 2 Samuel 7, we arrive at the El Capitan of the Old Testament, this text. But unlike Alex Honnold, friends, listen closely, King David has not free soloed this mountain unaided, for God has tethered David to the rope of his covenantal promises. And we will see that very clearly in the text tonight. I want to show you four movements in this text. You'll notice the, the most of it is a conversation. So it's not war and battle and narrative. It actually stops, and we behold a conversation happening between our two main characters in this story, namely God and David. Here's the first of those movements. I want you to see in verses one through three, David's concern for God's house. David's concern for God's house. Look back at verse one. Notice this language. Now when the king lived in his house and the Lord, notice this, had given him rest from all of his surrounding enemies, the king said to Nathan the prophet, see now I dwell in a house of cedar but the ark of God dwells in a tent. And Nathan said to the king, go do all that is in your heart, for the Lord is with you. We're told here in this text that the king is living in his house. Notice that. And the Lord has given him rest from who? All of his surrounding enemies. If you remember in 2 Samuel 5, David casted out evil in Jerusalem, this, this high place, this stronghold, this city that will become the city of God. He casts out evil from the city of God in the Jebusites, and he conquers the stronghold of Jerusalem. Jerusalem happens to be on the border of the northern and southern tribes, and it also happens to be on the border of the eastern and the western tribes. What does that mean? It means Jerusalem's a central place. It's a centralized place where, notice, the king now rules and reigns. And David isn't only the king of a centralized place, but he is the king of a centralized people. If you remember in chapter two, I preached it several months ago, David becomes king of Judah. And then a few chapters ago, you saw that David now has become king over Israel. So all of the 12 tribes have been unified in a centralized city of God type place by a king who's ruling and reigning and now resting. Are you seeing that? He hasn't only unified a people in a central place, but don't miss this. He's regathered the people around the worship of God. Second Samuel chapter six, what happens? He brings the Ark of the Covenant from outside the city 
into the city, and not just anywhere in the city. He brings it into the center of the city. Why? Because he's recentralizing God's people around the worship of God. Do you see what the text is making clear in just the first verse? David is being depicted as a new Adam, and Jerusalem is being depicted as a new Eden. Just think about it. Where Adam's evil cast them out of Eden, David will cast out evil in the Jebusites and bring God's people back into Eden. Where Adam's sin eventually divides the nation, David unites the nation and brings them back. Where Adam forfeited his priestly role in the garden, David assumes that priestly role by wearing an ephod and dancing and bringing the presence of God back into the center of the city. And he consecrates it. Where Adam's abuse of a tree kicks them out of the garden, David now lives and reigns in a mansion made of trees. He lives in a house of cedar. Now, one would think that with all of the accomplishment that is evident here in just the first couple verses, that David would have every reason to rest. I mean, the man has done a lot for the nation And what do we see often in our culture today, friends? We often see that immense accomplishments often give birth to intense apathy. Accomplishment, a lot of it, often gives birth to apathy. What do we do? We look to make a lot of money. Why? So that we can retire and vacation. We desire to amass a lot of things. Why? So that we can play with our toys. Children play with toys. Adults play with toys. It's all the same thing We do what the fool does in Luke 12 when after we've amassed ample goods for ourselves, what do we say to ourselves in our hearts? Relax, eat, drink, and be merry. And God comes to that fool and says, fool, tonight your soul is required of you. Like Alex Honnold, who summited the greatest feat in climbing and yet doesn't rest, King David also has summited the greatest feat in his kingship and yet does not rest. David has mastered a feat that none before him have, but there's something still missing. Look at verse two. Look at verse two in 2 Samuel 7. The king said to Nathan the prophet, see now I dwell in a house of cedar, but the ark of God dwells in a tent. And Nathan said to the king, go do all that is in your heart for the Lord is with you. David is concerned for God's house. For he lives in a mansion while the ark of God dwells in a tent. But he doesn't get too far into this blueprint, he hatches a plan to build the Lord a house, but he he doesn't get super far into the blueprint before the Lord meets with Nathan and interrupts the plan. Here's where we see our second movement in the text. We saw David's concern for God's house. Now I want you to see God's correction of David's plan in verses four through seven. God's correction of David's plan. Look at your Bible at verse four. But that same night, the word of the Lord came to Nathan Go and tell my servant David, thus says the Lord, would you build me a house to dwell in? I have not lived in a house since the day I brought up the people of Israel from Egypt. Think, think the connections here to Moses, connections to the Exodus in the, in the tabernacle. He says to this day, but I have been moving about in a tent for my dwelling. Verse seven, in all places where I have moved with all the people of Israel. That, that same language there, moved with all the people of Israel, is the same exact language that we see in Genesis 1 and 2 when God was moving about. Genesis 3, when God was moving about in the cool of the day of the garden. Did I speak a word with any of the kings of Israel, any of the judges of Israel, with whom I commanded to shepherd my people Israel, saying, why have you not built me a house of cedar? God comes to correct David's plan. Friends, when I was a little boy in church, my dad used to give me $10 to put in the offering plate. It was his money, but I put it in the plate. And as big of a deal as I felt putting my dad's money in the offering plate for the church, it wasn't my money. It was my dad's. And my dad, I just can imagine, thought to himself, that's really cute, son. That's really cute. I imagine God looking at David's desire here in this text to build him a house in the same way. That's cute, David. That's cute. God says in the text, would you build me a house to dwell in? Friends, God isn't asking a question to David. He's making a statement. 
The, the Lord built the cosmos. He cannot be housed. He owns the cattle on a thousand hills. In fact, Isaiah 66, one through two says this, thus says the Lord, this is so good, heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool. What is, notice that word, the house that you would build for me. And what is that, notice that place of my, what, rest. All these things my hand has made. And so all these things came to be, declares the Lord. God says, I'll build a house for my name. Don't you worry, I'm gonna build it but you're not going to build it for me, David. I'm going to build it through you. God says, I didn't choose those shepherds. Notice the text, verse seven, the judges. I didn't choose those shepherds. I chose this shepherd from the house of Jesse who will one day bring along the good shepherd from his lineage. Continuing on friends with this shepherd imagery, let's look at our third movement in the text. And this is where I wanna kind of anchor down for a little bit. Here's the third thing we see, God's covenant for David's house. From verses eight to 16, we see very clearly God's covenant for David's house. Look at verse eight. Now, therefore, thus you shall say to my servant David, thus says the Lord of hosts. Notice this language. I took you from the pasture, from following the sheep, that you should be, notice that word, prince over my people Israel. And I have been with you wherever you went as a prince, And as a prince, I cut off all your enemies from before you. Uh, Friends, notice how the prince has brought peace. Peace in Jerusalem, peace by the work of his God, uh, foreshadowing the true prince of peace that will come from his lineage. Continuing on, and I will make for you a great name, like the name of the great ones of the earth. And I will appoint a place for my people Israel, and I will plant them so that they may dwell in their own place and be disturbed no more. And violent men shall afflict them no more as formerly from the time that I appointed judges over my people Israel. And I will give you rest from all your enemies. Moreover, the Lord declares to you that the Lord will make you a house. When your days are fulfilled and you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up your offspring after you who shall come from your body. And I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be to him a father and he shall be to me a son When he commits iniquity, I will discipline him with the rod of men, with the stripes of the sons of men, but my steadfast love will not depart from him as I took it from Saul, whom I put away from before you. And your house and your kingdom shall be made sure forever before me. Your throne shall be established forever. In accordance with all these words and in accordance with all this vision, Nathan spoke to David. We've now arrived at the summit of El Capitan, where we will turn around to behold the views of God's providence and covenantal promises to and through David. But as David reaches the summit, notice verse nine. As David reaches the summit, we remember he hasn't free soloed this mountain, for God has been with him. While God, friends, has worked through David and in David, He has surely gone before David. Friends, the Edenic sin of self-sufficiency rises in us often, doesn't it? It tempts us to believe that we, apart from God, can do good and be good. Well, verse nine, God reminds David that the only good that we do for God is because of the good that he has already done for us. This text makes it crystal clear. Verse nine says, I have been with you wherever you went and I've cut off all your enemies from before you. You didn't free solo El Capitan, David. I anchored your rope and I acted as your anchoring carabiners the whole way up. I was your safety gear. I was the blood in your veins. I was the very action from your brain that gave neurons to your fingers and your legs to do all these movements. I took you to the summit, but I did all the work. I wanna look at three promises that God makes to David in this covenant. Three promises. We'll, we'll look at them as kind of anchoring carabiners in the wall as David climbed. That God has given to David as he's summited El Capitan. Here's the first one. God promises David a great name and a restful place. God promises David a great name and a restful place. We see that in verses 9b through 11a. Look at verse nine halfway through the verse. 
God says, I will make for you a great name, like the names of the great ones of the earth. Uh, Friends, this language in the text connects David to who? To Abraham. The, The Davidic covenant is connected here to the Abrahamic covenant in that God promises Abraham that he will make his name great. Let's go back there and read together, Genesis 12, 1 and 2. Now the Lord said to Abram, go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you, and I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. From Abraham's families, we're told that all of the families of the earth will be blessed, And the author here in 2 Samuel is connecting the promise given to Abraham through the promise given to David, which will then give to all the peoples of the earth. So so he's connecting Genesis 12 and 15 to 2 Samuel 7 here in this text. And, And yet, friends, it isn't just a name, it's a place. So we must ask, what's the connection between the great name that we see in this covenant and the great um place? Well, look at the text. Look at verse 10. What what does God say in verse 10? He says, I will appoint a place for my people Israel, and I will plant them. Notice place, plant. Then in verse 11, he says that this place of planting will be a place of rest. Notice this, cue in on this. A place where God's people are planted, and that in that place there is rest. The author is drawing us to Eden again. It's Eden. So, so catch this. God is connecting David to Eden. He's done it already through Adam. Here he's doing it through Abraham, but he won't just do it through Adam and Abraham. He will do it as well through Moses and Joshua too. We're going to see in just a second. Um, as I was studying, I found out this is, this is kind of a way that you can view the covenant, okay? God has promised these things to, you know, the Proto-Evangelium, Genesis 3. You have, you have uh, uh, Noah, you have Abraham, and they kind of just filter like sand in an hourglass, and they come to this focal point in the middle. We're going to treat that focal point as the Davidic covenant. The Davidic covenant is going to be the answer to all of these covenants that have been promised before that will focalize in David and then empty out into all of the families of the earth. That's how, a way we can see what's happening here in this text. Look at verse 11b. Moreover, the Lord declares to you that the Lord will make you a house, a house. This is the exact same language that we see in Deuteronomy chapter 12. It's on the screen if you want to look. Here's what Moses says. But when you go over the Jordan, when you go over the Jordan, think Joshua. Think the book of Joshua. When you go over the Jordan, and and then he says, and live in the land. Think the promised land. That the Lord your God is giving you to inherit. And when he gives you, notice it there in the text, rest from all of your enemies. Think, think. Think first verse of this text, 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse 1. The Lord is in his house, and he's ruling, and he's reigning, and his people have rest. It's the same thing. So that you live in safety. Verse 10, 2 Samuel verse 10. Think about safety. Violent men won't afflict them any longer. Then to the place, verse 11. David has reconquered the high place in Jerusalem and has reinstituted and reconsecrated it as a new Eden. To the place. That the Lord your God will choose to make his... Notice it there again, his name dwell there, that you shall bring all that I command you, your burnt offerings and your sacrifices. Second Samuel 6, right? David and the people are bringing in the uh, Ark of the Covenant. David's wearing the ephod, he's dancing. They stop and they're marching every six steps. They stop and they sacrifice. Why? To commemorate what God did in Eden. To commemorate, to consecrate. All of it's coming right back here, guys, in Deuteronomy 12. David is the fulfillment of all that's promised here in Deuteronomy 12. 12, he brings it to the center of the city and they consecrate Eden once again to God. So David is not only connected to Adam and Abraham, but he's also connected to Moses and Joshua as the fulfillment of the Exodus conquest. Moses is raised up as a priest king-like figure to Exodus God's people to a promised place. But he fails to get there himself. Joshua is then raised up to conquer and brings people into a promised place, but he dies and the people become wicked in the time of the judges and they are decentralized and they worship other gods. But friends, the Davidic king, acting like a new conquering Joshua, has reconquered the promised place and has re-centralized its people around the worship of God once again. 
So that's why the name and the place of planting and rest are connected in the text. But it isn't just a great name and a restful place. What do we also see? God promises David a dynasty. He promised David a dynasty and an eternal kingdom. We see that in verses 11b to 13a. The Lord is going to build David a house, a meaning, uh, when we say house, we're, we're meaning a dynasty. There's a, gonna be a dynasty of kings that will come from David. Go with me to the second half of verse 11 in 2 Samuel 7. When your days are fulfilled and you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up your offspring after you who shall come from your body and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name. So we're told that David is gonna have a house, but the way that David will have this house is through his offspring. David is promised a house or a temple, but he will not build that house or temple. Solomon will actually build the temple but it's imperfect because in the Babylonian exile, that temple is going to be destroyed. And so this is, it's foreshadowing to us a better son of David who will establish a temple in himself, a, a temple of which God's spirit will dwell. And then he will impart that into his other temples, those who believe in him. So the temple's destroyed, but then centuries later, through an announcement given to Mary in a little town called Bethlehem, there is an announcement of a new son of David one who will come and this son of David says, destroy this temple, speaking about his own body and I'll raise it up in three days. God doesn't just promise a place or a house or a kingdom. Thirdly, we see this, God promises David an everlasting throne of authority. God promises David a throne of everlasting authority. Verses 13b through 16, what do we see? Look at verse Second half of verse 13, I will establish, God says, a throne. When you, when you see throne, think authority, think authority. I will establish the authority, the throne of his kingdom, notice forever. And I will be to him a father and he shall be to me a son. When he commits iniquity, I will discipline him with the rod of men, with the stripes of the sons of men. Uh, friends, just immediately, th this is something called telescoping where God will kind of, foreshadow something to come, but he will give someone that's kind of a shorter fulfillment of that. That's what's happening in all these covenants, but, but they'll fail. And so the telescoping image here we get is David's son, Solomon. Solomon will commit iniquity. Solomon will be punished. Although he will build the temple where God's presence will dwell, he will fail. Let's keep reading. Verse 15, and my steadfast love will not depart from him as I took it from Saul. Speaking of Solomon's offspring whom I put away from before you. And your house and your kingdom shall be made sure forever before me. Your throne shall be established forever in accordance with all these words and in accordance with all this vision, Nathan spoke to David. Solomon, God's servant, will suffer because of his own sin and he will die. But Jesus Christ, the true suffering servant, won't suffer because of his sin, but because of ours. And he too will suffer and die, but he will not die and stay dead. He will raise, but by his death, he will establish a kingdom and a throne forever, forever. Jesus says, I, was, I came across this verse this week and I, and I saw it in a new light. John 12, 24, it's gonna be on the screen. Jesus says this, speaking about himself, very truly I tell you, unless a kernel of wheat speaking about himself, falls to the ground and dies. It remains only a single seed, but if it dies, it produces many seeds. Friends, the promised seed must fall, must come to the earth, taking on human form. He must suffer and die and by his death produce life in many other seeds who believe and trust in him for salvation. Friends, this is the gospel and it's all over this text. David reestablishes a new Eden once again. Jesus will gain for us a better Eden once and for always. David reigns in an earthly city where God's presence dwells, but Jesus will reign forever in a heavenly city where we literally sing about it tonight, his very presence will be our light. David will die, or excuse me, David conquers his enemies for a time. Jesus will conquer his enemies forever. Sin, death, and Satan, they will have no victory with Jesus. 
David will die without building the temple of God. Jesus will die as the temple of God. And his people will be made into a living temple by God's spirit. David brought his people into a place of temporary rest. Jesus will bring his people to a place of eternal rest. And he will himself be their rest. David establishes his kingdom living in a house of trees. Jesus will establish his kingdom by dying on a tree. David dies not seeing the offspring who will defeat sin and death. Jesus dies as this offspring defeating sin and death. David is made a prince by God who brings temporary peace to his suffering people. Jesus is going to be the true prince of peace, bringing ultimate peace by suffering for his people. David sits on a throne temporarily and is given the promise of a throne. Jesus sits on the throne eternally and is himself the fulfillment of the throne. Friends, there was a seed promised in Genesis 3.15 who would crush the head of the serpent, but it wasn't Adam and it wasn't Cain, and it wasn't Noah, and it wasn't Abraham, and it wasn't Moses, and it wasn't any of these people, it wasn't even David. This promised seed that will crush the serpent's head is Jesus, who suffered and died on the cross and rose so that all who would put their faith and trust in him would have life. And finally, we see our fourth movement in the text. Notice lastly, and I'm going to use this section as application because I think it really has to do with how we as God's people respond to what God has done for us. Notice lastly, David's prayer of praise. Notice lastly, David's prayer of praise, verses 18 to 29. David's response to God's grace shows us several things that we must take stock of as Christians. Here's the first one. They're not on the screen, so you just have to listen closely. Here's the first thing that God's grace reminds us of. God's grace reminds us of who is in control. God's grace reminds us of who is in control. And guys, this text makes it clear over the fullness of all we've read and all we're about to read that God is the one doing these things. It's not David doing them. David is participating in them, but God has sovereignly, providentially ordained David to walk in them. Notice verse 18. You have brought me this far. Notice verse 19b, you have spoken this for your servant. Verse 21, because of your promise and according to your own heart, you brought about all this greatness. Verse 23, you redeemed your people. Verse 24, you established your people. Verse 27, you have made this revelation. Verse 29, you, O Lord God, have spoken and with your blessing shall the house of your servant be blessed forever. God's grace reminds us of who is in control. Friends, while it may feel in our life like we are in control, clearing our own path in life, God has actually cleared the path and his people just walk down the path that he's already cleared. Remember, man plans his ways, but the Lord directs his steps. And we're also reminded in this text, and it is abundantly clear that God's grace is motivated by God's glory. God's grace, what he does in creation and in eternity is motivated by his own glory. Guys, God didn't do this in David's life because David is awesome. God did this in David's life because he is awesome. He did it for his own glory. He did it for his own name. Number three, God's grace should drive us to adoration. God's grace should drive us to adoration. Look at verses 22 through 24. Therefore, David says, you are great, O Lord, for there is none like you, and there is no God beside you. According to all that we have heard with our ears, and and who is like your people Israel, the one nation of earth whom God went to redeem to be his people, making himself a name, And doing for them great and awesome things by driving out before your people whom you redeemed for yourself from Egypt, a nation and its gods. And you establish for yourself, your people Israel, to be your people forever. And you, O Lord God, became their God. Guys, this text reminds us that God is God and we are not. Our attempts to free solo the mountain failed 10 times out of 10, and yet God has kept us by his grace. God's graciousness is part of his greatness. David makes that very clear to us in this text. Notice fourthly, 
God's grace should do what? Should drive us to pray. God's grace should drive us to prayer. We see that all over verses 18 through 29, but look at verses 27 specifically. Verse 27, for you, O Lord of hosts, uh, David says, the God of Israel have made this revelation to your servant saying, I will build you a house. Therefore, your servant has found courage to pray this prayer to you. Notice that when David recognizes God's gracious promise, he is driven to pray to this great God. And notice verse 25 about what David prays and how he prays. Look at verse 25. David says, confirm forever the word that you have spoken. Concern the word that you have spoken. Concerning your servant and his house. And notice at the very end, and do as you have spoken. Friends, we need to pray like David does in this text. Notice that David prays for God's will to be done. He prays for God's will to be done. It reminds me to some extent of how Jesus prays in the Sermon on the Mount. What does he say? Father, your kingdom come, your will be done. We need to pray like David and Jesus. We need to pray for God's will to be done. I don't even know what number I'm on, five maybe? I don't know, there's so much here. There's so much here, guys. This was so fun this week to study this, okay? God's grace should reinforce our trust. God's grace should reinforce our trust. Verse 28, notice verse 28. David says, your words are true. Those four words are some powerful words in this text. Guys, if God has said it, God will do it. We can take that to the bank. We can trust his promises are true and his word is sure a hundred times out of a hundred. This text starts with David's plan to build God a house, but in the eternal counsel of God's wisdom, he had a better plan to build David a house. Friends, listen, this is why, this is why it's okay when God doesn't do what we think he should. This text makes it clear, it is okay when God does not answer our prayer requests like we request them. Texts like this remind us that if you think that you have a good plan for your life, God has a better one. Who could have thought this? Who could have contrived this? Who could have knit this and woven this together if not our great God? Remember, David didn't free solo. He has been tethered and brought to the summit by the grace of God. And God's grace to David should anchor and reinforce our trust and our dependence in him. And here's the last thing I wanna show you. I think it's six, I don't know. Just write write it down if you want to. God's grace should always elicit gratitude and humility. I mean, when you're looking at that section where God's promising all this covenant to David, I can just imagine being David and sitting there before Nathan and, and hearing all of these things said to you. Where you had this great aspiration to build God a house, he comes back and hits you with the reply and says, no, David, you're not gonna build me a house. I'm gonna build you a house and here's how I'm gonna do it. I can just imagine being David so minuscule and small in the grand scheme of things and just sitting back and beholding all of these promises to him and thinking what? Gratitude And humility. Friends, David has the same reaction that any of us in this room should have. Look at verse 18. Who am I, O Lord God? And what is my house that you have brought me thus far? It's like what Ruth says. We just looked at it this past Wednesday when she says, Why have you taken notice of me since I am a foreigner? It's like what Abraham says when he said, Lord, I am just dust and ashes. It's like Isaiah in chapter six when he says, I am a man of unclean lips and I live amongst a people of unclean lips. David here in verse 18 says, who am I, O Lord God? And what is my house that you have brought me this far? Friends, this should always be our response to God's graciousness in our life. Friends, when you find yourself by grace, if you're in Christ, when you find yourself by grace at the summit of El Capitan, looking back across the valley of God's providence and promises and looking over the cliff to see what the Lord has brought you up, what do you do? What can you say? You say what David says in verse 18. 
Who am I, O Lord God? And what is my house that you have brought me thus far? Let's pray. Father, we give you all the praise and all the glory. No one could have dreamed to do this. No one, as they turn around on the summit of El Capitan, can look back and contrive how you providentially and sovereignly navigated David to this point. How when he was laboring away in caves and when he was the Lord's anointed and when he was waiting for his time to, to rule and he was being faithful and he was, he, was, he was literally out in the wilderness and then he becomes king, not just of Judah, but, but king of Israel and, and, and how righteously he acts, Lord. And we come to this place where we see the focal point of the hourglass. How could, Lord, anybody else but you, O oh great God, contrive this plan and write your scripture in this way? Father, we give you all the praise and all the glory for who are we, O oh Lord God, and what is our house? that you have given this grace to us. Father, we love you. We pray all this in the mighty, matchless name of Jesus. Amen.